Do they require any markings on the property? Uh, do they require the surveyor to be there? Oh. Uh, could you address that, please? Sometimes what the planning, <coughs> excuse me, the planning board is asked an applicant to do is to show where the center line of the public access way might be, as well as, um, so I would think in this case, what might be appropriate would be for you to show that mm -hmm. for, all, for, all, for all four potential sites, um, at a minimum, and anything else the board might want to ask for could be provided. Um, that's usually at least a minimal amount of information. It, the surveyor doesn't have to be there, but usually it's a surveyor that puts them in the field. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rutherford, for your patience. Okay, next, um, Meadow View, a subdivision review on Mitchell Road, pre-application conference, section 16-2-2. Is there um, a representative for Meadow View here? Hi, how are you? Welcome to the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board. If we, um, I guess Jerry will help you. Before you begin, um, we usually ask the applicant to limit his um, comments to no more than 15 minutes. You wouldn't go beyond that, would you? Oh, good. So we're not imposing on your kindness. Okay, thank you. We'll step right up and give us your names and be happy to hear about your proposal. Thank you. use the microphone since our secretary okay. is here. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, Lisa Cowan from Mitchell & Associates. Uh, we've been retained by KW Associates, who are the owners of the property, to prepare uh, preliminary subdivision plans or, and feasibility study for this site. The site is located on Mitchell Road, number 379, and is approximately 12.4 acres. Tonight I'll be presenting information prepared and developed by Mitchell & Associates, but we're also utilizing information um, supplied by other consultants. Uh, they are the survey by Owen Haskell Associates, soils information by uh, Albert Frick Associates, and uh, wetlands information by John Lordy Associates. I will be presenting three plans tonight as quickly as possible. Um, that illustrate the process that we went through to determine the best uh, possible design for this particular lot. Uh, the first plan is a soils map, and what it does is it classifies the different soils on the site, uh, shows where preliminary test pits have been um, placed, and also shows where bedrock outcrops exist on the site. The second plan is our site analysis plan, which incorporates some information from the soils plan and then also uh, illustrate some of our analysis of physical and, and visual characteristics of the site. And the third plan is a, what we call a sketch plan, which is our idea of what we think is the best solution for this particular site um, in terms of uh, residential development. Okay, I want to get in the way here. Okay, the soils map is right here, and that, that's the first plan. 
Um, and this is, these are the results of a high intensity soil survey that was done. Excuse me, can you orient me a little bit to where 379 Mitchell Road is? Sorry, that's right. Um, okay, in this location map here is not a very um, large one for this site, but um, yeah. um, where Stonegate is. Oh, yes. Yeah. Could you Stone please come up to the microphone and state your name? And uh, my name is Ken Tubbs of KW Associates. Um, if you're familiar with Stonegate, their main entrance is north of our property, and they have an egress onto Mitchell Road, which I believe is their phase two, and we're directly across from that. So you're in the opposite side of the street from Stonegate. Right. Correct. Former uh, Sondergaard property, it's a uh, yellow ranch that sits back about 200 feet. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Who are, the, who are the principals in KW Associates? Uh, myself and uh, Mr. Wayne Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Tubbs. Um, Please go on, Ms. Collins. Okay, a quick review of the soils map. Um, again, this is the result of a high-intensity soil survey. It's preliminary at this point because at the time of the study, the, uh, there was frost in the ground, and therefore they will, may have to go back and verify a few things. But what we did here was uh, divide the soils into five color groups to more or less illustrate their impact on development and density calculations. Um, for this site. The darkest soil uh, color, the darkest brown, indicates uh, very poorly drained soil. Um, and th the classes are shown on this, this map. I'm not going to go through each one. The next shade of brown, next lighter brown, are marginal soils or uh, somewhat poorly drained soils. The <coughs> next lighter shade indicates uh, upland, shallow, possibly shallow to bedrock soils. And then on the far, on the east side of the site, away from me, um, the, the next shade over there uh, shows a group that is uh, moderately well-drained, basically good soil in terms of um, septic systems and whatever. And then finally, that uh, light beige color over there indicates the building land uh, on the site. This plan also shows, which may not be as easy to see, but there are hatched areas where uh, there are, um, the Albert Frick Associates identified uh, bedrock outcrops at the surface. At the time of the soil survey, they also um, um, made some test pits just to find out uh, the feasibility of septic systems on the site, and out of 14 test pits, 13 passed for septic systems. Um, flip this. Was, was it 13 that passed in one particular period? No, um, no, as a matter of fact, they. Oh, I'm coming away from the. Uh, <laughs> you can point that as we go. Uh, there are uh, along the yeah, bottom of the site, along the southern portion, and then along the top of the site. So they basically go all the way around that area, that particular area, which is the only area we made test fits on. Yes. Okay. okay, as I said before, the site analysis plan incorporates a little bit of the information that um, we got from the soils map, and it also illustrates some more of the um, opportunities and constraints for the site. The site can be characterized in um, three different or distinct type of vegetative and landform zones. Uh, the furthest away from me on the uh, eastern portion of the site, that uh, can be classified as an open sloping meadow. It's where the existing house is located right now. And that meadow is bordered by existing trees, mature trees, um, that run <coughs> along Mitchell Road and then along the uh, northern portion of the site. Um, the middle portion of the site, by the lighter green color in the middle there, um, is characterized by shrubby vegetation with younger trees and it is a characteristic of a wetland. So therefore it has um, not as a dense character, L lower shrub species. Which area is that? That is from here to here. That's what I'm calling the middle portion of the site. And then the back portion, from 
approximately here over is characterized by a head a densely wooded site, mostly evergreen, and it has uh, lots of knolls or uh, small hills and a brook, a uh, few brooks that run through the site. The site, in terms of the plan for planning purposes, the site is also divided into two um, zones with, um, for um, land, uh, land use zones. The zone line that exists is right here, and on the side of, um, away from me on the Mitchell Road side it is the RC zone, and the side towards me is the RA zone. And that the RA zone covers the majority portion, the majority of the uh, portion of the site. As for the surrounding area of Mitchell of the Mitchell Road area, um, there's a variety of, of lot sizes. It ranges from a ver very small lots of uh, maybe as little as 10 to 15,000 square feet to larger lots that may have horse barns and fields and corrals and whatever. Um, on the corner that you can see cut out uh, away from me is, a very, is an indication of a very small lot and then some of the lots that border on the northern side are much larger and more open in character. A tote road also runs along the southern portion of the site here for a, a little ways. And then within the site, as we have uh, shown on the plan there, uh, there is at, there's an old logging road that was developed um, that runs through the site and um, provides access from the front of the site to the back. That's the thing that's the sort of zipper going Yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, the site contains a variety of landforms due to its slopes and this plan indicates those. Um, the slopes on the front portion of the site, again, that front portion in the lighter green, range from 3 to 15 percent. Um, the middle portion, is being that it's a wetland, flat, so the slopes are somewhere around 0 percent. And the, while the back area, again, goes back up and ranges between 3 to 20 percent. Um, for sake of determining the density, the cluster of the density, uh, the density of a cluster development. We have shown on this plan those uh, the slopes that are over 15%. Views from the site, as indicated from the project, there are views from the site as indicated by the project's name, and they're shown over there by the double arrows. Um, on the site, the views from the upland portions, views into the site um, are uh, taken that the wetland areas, uh, shrubby wetland areas with a backdrop of evergreen. Um, and then as indicated by the two arrows near the top of the plant, views off the idea of taking uh, open fields, uh, barn and meadow areas, rock, uh, old rock walls, and um, in general the open characteristic of the areas of the site. Another type of uh, view is that view from the car. And what we did for, for the purposes of, of tonight was to um, take a preliminary reading of the site distance directly across from the stone gate entrance. Could you point that out, Ken? Which is right there. And I, I neglected to mention that there's the stone gate entrance is right there. Um, so we took a, a preliminary reading of the site distance very adequate, there's between three and four hundred feet on both sides as you look down the road. But we will look at that further when we um, submit for uh, our preliminary drawing. Okay, given the information I just um, went over, um, what Mitchell Associates uh, with the client um, when we were compiled all this information and um, looked at the site from several standpoints. Uh, we prepared a few alternates. And one, one of the alternates was to approach the site from the standard subdivision, and, uh, single family subdivision, given the existing uh, parameters, of zoning, and whatever, and uh, basically saying well, we would develop the site from front to back, utilize every portion of the site, somebody would own every portion of the site. But then looking at the, um, the good you know, the characteristics of the site, some of the limitations, um, we thought it best to um, retain as much of that back area as possible as common open space and to cluster 
any development in the front of the lot. This way we would be impacting that back area as little as possible and then retaining it for um, as an open space area. The handout that I gave you um, shows our calculations for cluster density, the allowable density for a cluster single lot according to the zoning ordinance. And just for time purposes, I wasn't planning on going through it. If you have any questions about it, if you go through it, um, we can discuss that. But in general, um, what we did was we took the two zone areas, we adjusted the zone line as allowed in the zoning ordinance over 30 feet. So we took the RC zone line and moved it over, a little tough to see, over towards me, 30 feet. And um, it, it is allowed in the zoning ordinance when a lot is divided into two zones. Um, so we did that and then we figured the density, the cluster density on each separate zone area and then added them together at the end. So of course figuring the cluster density, it takes the gross area and subtracts out um, on land or land with certain constraints like wetlands and ledge and whatever. So that is illustrated on that handout. Um, I just would like to go over the sketch plan briefly and then we can open it up for further questions. Uh, so this, this sketch plan right here shows our proposed design and what we did when we, after we decided to go with the cluster concept, we looked at um, what the, uh, where the existing entrance to Stone Gate was. It made a lot of sense to locate something directly across from there. Um, we also wanted to retain as many trees as possible. Can I ask why it made sense to locate the entrance directly across? Uh, in terms of site distance and traffic concerns, if you stagger an entrance, people you may uh, cause some problems. I know that that is a preference on some uh, roadway engineers and town engineers' part to line up entrances or roadways across from each other, make a four-way intersection instead of a staggered intersection. In, in a rural, what we hope is a rural area? I don't know if I call it rural, but what, we, we... What we would like to call rural? And I'm, not, I'm, I'm asking the question out of ignorance. It seems to me my, my gut reaction would have been the opposite. It would, would have been to not create that look of roads right across from each other, um, which well, gives you more of a city only, view. That was not the only um, consideration, but it was a consideration. Uh, another big consideration was the trees were on the site. And there is a line of trees um, that exist just part way down there. Some of those are proposed plantings. But there is a line of trees that runs down. We wanted to move the road over to take advantage of those and to retain them on the site. I think it was a, a good coincidence that lined up with the stone gate entrance because I think most uh, engineers that I've talked to about traffic considerations usually like to line them up. But um, I understand what your point was. Um, the front lots. Uh, I'd say lots near, yeah, closer to Mitchell Road. The smaller lots uh, average about 16 to 18,000 square feet. And those back lots average around the cul-de-sac area average somewhere around 30,000 square feet or 28,000, excuse me, square feet. Um, we have shown approximate or um, possible locations for houses and driveways just to illustrate what the, um, the development might look like, but these, of course, are not set in stone and uh, just give you an idea of the character of the site. Um, also, they're based on specific locations of preliminary test systems. Um, but let me ask you a question about, uh, am I asking too many questions? No, please go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Are the rest of you here? <laughs> <laughs> you um, recognize Mr. Boxer. <laughs> the language on dividing the lots uh, states that where a district boundary uh, divides a lot which was of record at the time of enactment of this ordinance, um, then requirements for the less restrictive part may be extended 30 feet. It's, it, this is not a model of clarity, um, but the words that spring out are divides a lot which was of record at the time of enactment. Um, are any of those other lots that were recorded? Oh, the, um, this is one lot right now, and that is the lot, I 
think of record at the time. Um, and that is a lot bisected by the imaginary line from RC and RA zones. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, I think. I, I think what this was intended to get at was if you had a subdivision and there were lots, and the zoning line or the district went through, uh, then they weren't going to penalize you with a pre-recorded lot. You're saying the entire thing is the lot. I'm not sure that really works in this case. Uh, is it possible as well that, that, that a zone line is kind of nebby, it's not necessarily pinned down and that they're saying that there is room here for um, one way or the other in the case of a lot being divided by one? That's how I was looking. But at you it. don't have a lot yet. That, I mean, what? No, I, I, the, the definition uh, seems to indicate that when the zone line runs to a lot, which is a lot, they can go 30 feet into the less restricted. They have a lot now. Madam Chairman, I, yes. that raises Mr. a question. I think we need to have uh, Mr. Leahy look at it to see if that is appropriate for changing density requirements. Well, tell me right. again what you did with the 30 feet. Do you see where the line is now? OK. Um. <laughs> OK. Can you point this out as I speak? That's where the existing line is right now. And it runs across the site. And, and the stuff on the road side the is road RC and um, the back stuff. And the back stuff is RA. Yeah. And what we did was take that line and move it over 30 feet and therefore do density calculations on that area as RC area, 30 feet more than it is, and figure that that extra area was included in the RC zone. And then subtracted that area. From yeah, the I, I stand you. That, that does not seem to me to be the intent of the ordinance to give yourself 30 feet. I think if you're in the middle of a subdivided lot, um, you know, it, it just seems to me that all you did was you got 30 feet. The line is where the line is, and it seems to me everything on the RC side of the line is subject to RC zoning, and everything on the RA is subject to RA, and you do your calculations that way. Um, but I, I, I agree with Dick. I think we, we need to know whether uh, whether you get an extra 30 feet. It seems yeah. to me the way you're interpreting it, you just get 30 feet. Well, because um, all, every parcel of land in the world is a lot. So if the line runs through the middle of, of any parcel of land, you're saying you get to move it 30 feet. That doesn't make much sense to me. Uh, I guess, yeah. <laughs> well, how are you going to Excellent um, questions. Uh, Mr. Boxer, please go on with your presentation. Okay. Um, um, I'm really, uh, um, yes, excuse um, me, uh, Mr. Most. Yeah, I just want to make a uh, point here. You know, this is a preliminary um, review of this, and uh, while it's, uh, you're getting into a lot of detail, which is, which is good, uh, I think it's important that you get across the, uh, the important issues of this, of this development so we can give you feedback. I assume that's what you want yeah. because you're not making your final presentation tonight. Yeah. Um, really, I was just about to wrap it up, okay. um, but wanted just to point out that we, as part of this cluster, um, what we are proposing to provide is access um, from the development through the back lot and tied into the pedestrian easement, which I looked at before. There is a pedestrian easement that runs along the western border of the property. Um, assuming it's from Canterbury on the Cape, I'm not sure. But we would be tying into that and allowing access to that. Well, thank you very much. This is most interesting. And I'm always very interested in seeing a, um, a clustered subdivision which retains a great deal of open space so um, I'm Chairman? sure we will be hearing more from you and receiving more information yes yeah. Mr. Most now that the applicant is complete I do have a couple of comments that I'd like to have the applicant uh, think of just if you want feedback at this point um, I was glad to hear you mention the pedestrian easement one question that crossed my mind was um, how would this in any way tie into our green belt and I might want to see a staff take a look at that I don't think it's close to it but on the other hand I don't know actually it would tie in with the Canterbury at the Cape easement which is part of the green belt which so is part be, of, so they so hook up to the existing system as proposed now okay the other question would be and I don't think you're in trouble here at all um, 
you've got a single entrance to the development, but it is real small, so I don't see where that would be a problem. And the length of the road, uh, is that noted on there? No, it isn't noted on there. Like that. So you'd be in no, there's no trouble there yeah. either, I guess. Okay, and you have talked about site site uh, distances. I think that you know we are sensitive to that. But mm -hmm. Those are my major comments. Anyone else? I can give you a, an observation or two um, for at least trying to read my mind in the future. Um, I'm concerned with maximum number of houses all being basically on Mitchell Road unless it's uh, deceptive and it goes back farther than it does. Um, one of the things that is becoming apparent to the Comprehensive Planning Commission in the Cape uh, is that the residents in this town want to preserve the rural atmosphere, uh, screening, buffering, etc. is important. Uh, I recognize that you have open space in the back. Um, I question whether you could get that many houses in with a conventional approach. Uh, I'm saying that frankly, I'm, I'm not sure you could. Um, you'd have one long dead end, uh, which would probably be longer than allowed by our ordinances, uh, or you'd have two exits that were awful close to each other. Um, so I'm, I'm not convinced that uh, you could have that many homes normally, and I think the cluster provisions do require that the uh, intended ordinances be met. So that's a question I have, and you'll have to convince me that uh, uh, that this isn't just a way to get more uh, house lots than you otherwise could. And, and again, I'm talking frankly with you because this is the process we have to go through. Uh, and somehow, um, I think we, we take away from uh, what people are trying to do for planning in the Cape, uh, if we have those homes all visible, which it looks like they will be uh, from Mitchell Road, I'd feel a lot more comfortable about this if, if things were reversed, if the uh, open space were um, on the road, protected people's views, preserved uh, the Cape rather than back where uh, uh, it'll be of use to some residents. I guess we'll have to explore whether it's usable because that's one of the requirements. Um, so those those are some of my initial observations. And I would like you to um, tell us next time around what difference it makes if you don't get that 30 feet. I suspect it's not a lot, but uh, uh, I'm not comfortable at all with, with the 30 foot bonus that you took. <laughs> Anyone else? Madam Chairman, yeah. I've got some um, similar comments about the clustering provisions in the town. The clustering provisions are special provisions that uh, landowners have the ability to take a piece of land and to creatively use it in a manner that's best for both the community and, and the people that would be buying into the development and not necessarily a device to take and put all the buildings in one portion of the site just because portions of the site cannot be used for other purposes. And so in that regard, it's a very similar concept to our, our, our discussion that Dan is um, uh, indicating. Um, and in terms of, of taking and putting a whole bunch of houses, maximizing the site and putting them together and calling that clustering, I don't think that's the intent of the ordinance, although I think that individually we'll have to review the intent of the ordinance as we go through this development proposal to, to see what that's being maintained. Um, so I guess my basic thought is there seem to be a lot of units. They may be allowed by the maximum uh, clustering provision and the densities that are allowed under the ordinance, but I'm not sure that the clustering provision of the ordinance, the intent has been met uh, for this project. I'm sure there'll be a lot more data that'll come later. Um, we have some side yard and setback areas, and I'm not sure what the scale is here, uh, but they appear to be minimal, uh, both off Mitchell Road and off other residential properties. I think that would be of concern as well. Thank you, Mr. Tinsman. Anyone else? Well, we thank you very much for uh, telling us about Meadow View. And I assume we will see you again.
Okay, next on our agenda, the Highlands at Broad Cove, a subdivision review, pre-application conference, section 16-2-2, and I see that there is a representative of the applicants here, Mr. Moore. You've had an awful lot of work lately. Thank you. Unfortunately, unfortunately, I'm not sure which. I am here, I was waiting for Mr. Fensco, who is Greater Portland Development Group's attorney, and David Taylor from our office to show up to handle this presentation. <laughs> However, in their absence, and because this is a pre-application conference, I think the job of presenting this plan has, has fallen upon me. Well, we also apologize at the late hour. Um, you were supposed to be on the agenda at 9.15, and we're running about 20 minutes late, so. What I'd like to do is, Sorry. no problem. I think what I'd like to do is just spend about 10 minutes touching on where we are in the process and why this plan is before you. As indicated in the cover letter that was sent to the board with this plan, the plan that is before you this evening for discussion is really a plan that you have seen previously just about 11 months ago. In April of 1988, we presented three alternative plans to you to take a look at the opportunities that this particular site had. Again, I'm assuming some familiarity on the board's part. Most of the board members that were here, all of them, in fact, were at that meeting last April. But the property the Greater Portland Development Group owns consists of two parcels that total a little over 70 acres. A roughly 50-acre parcel of what we call the north or the northern portion, which runs from Pine Ridge Road, Channel View, and north of Hunts Point, which cuts through the center of this drawing. And then a southerly portion that's about 28 acres that runs from Two Lakes Road back over to Winding Way and Running Tide Road. We had gone through an extensive inventory work and wetlands delineation that was done by eco-analysts. We had done a high-intensity soil survey. All of that information has been presented previously. What we're looking at this evening is that alternative C, and we're coming back and revisiting that because at the time that this went before the board, that was the one that if the board had a preference, they preferred this. I wouldn't say that the board embraced the plan, but in reviewing my notes from that time, the statement was that of the three alternatives presented, there was a 15 lot, 12 lot, and 11 lot subdivision. The 11 lot subdivision was a preferred plan. So with that as, as the groundwork, what this plan considers and what we're asking the board to comment on this evening are the basic uh, tenets of this proposal, which are that we look at the northern portion of the site as a six lot subdivision. That in order to achieve access to those six lots, we extend channel view approximately 100 to 150 feet into the site. What this does is this makes channel view a 900 foot long dead end road. That was some discussion at that at the last uh, meeting and discussion about the length your ordinance has been revised, so we now find that falls into compliance with what the ordinance now contemplates for maximum length to a dead end road. My recollection, and this is from memory, was that there were 17 lots on that road. And again, I, I would have to check the notes, but I'm pretty sure there are 17 lots which exist in Channel U. So we're looking at two more lots, lots five and six coming off that road. The other four lots, which were posed in the upland area of this northern portion, uh, four lots that will be served off a new cul-de-sac which enters into the property. When Main Savings Bank, through Broad Lights Associates, was conveying parcels, they retained, I believe, a 55 or 60 foot right-of-way out to Hunts Point Road. What we're proposing to do is utilize that and tie in with the new cul-de-sac built to town standards but to be preserved at the dead end street. This would be a 650 foot long road serving those four lots. The larger portion of this, approximately 20 acres, 19 acres, 20 acres, on the lower portion would be a dedicated portion of land to be given to the land trust. It encompasses the major wetland on the site that is part of the contiguous wetland that runs down through and out to the ocean. We feel that's an important resource. It's something we've been carrying forward as a protected area. We would also utilize a walkway, a pedestrian walkway, which is shown on your sketch plan, that would tie out 
the two lights portion of the property down and through and tie into the existing right of way of Pine Ridge Road. Peter Kennedy, through his organization, the Greater Portland Development Group, would deed that right of way or easement to the Conservation Commission in town to connect in their Greenbelt plan. This corresponds with the Greenbelt plan in terms of the desire for access. The Greenbelt plan actually shows that walkway cutting through the center of the site. We propose to move it down in the location on the lower portion of the site. And then any and all rights that Mr. Kennedy has through Great Portland in Pine Ridge Road, he would dedicate in total, in addition to the fee interest in that, to conservation. So we're looking at this interconnecting with the Greenbelt system in town to be integrated into this uh, area to be dedicated to the land trust. The intent of Mr. Kennedy is that that be a dedicated wildlife area. And on the plan, um, it indicates that we do want to have that as a nature conservancy, some place that protects that natural resource and protects the pond and becomes uh, an area really for a wildlife preserve. The utilities on this would be served by underground electric. It would be served by an extension of the existing water line. And then sewer would be handled by on-site subsurface disposal. If you can recall back three and a half years ago, we had a 22 lot scheme that looked at 22 lots on site for subsurface disposal. What we're doing is just looking at serving each of those sites with one on site subsurface disposal pit. Those aren't shown here. In the event that this does move forward, we would bring that documentation up. On the southerly portion of the site, what we're proposing for this area is that winding way be extended again as a private way with a T intersection to serve two lots, lots seven and eight that we keep out of the wetland area which was delineated on that southern portion and limit our building areas to the upper uh, wetland area, uh, excuse me, the upper upland area, <laughs> stay out of the wetland, and utilize those of the building lots again using subsurface disposal pits. The extension of Winding Way would push that out to just about an 850 foot dead end road. So again, we're staying within that tolerance that's set forth in the ordinance serving those two lots. We would do the same thing coming off Hunts Point Road again in the strip that was preserved through sales of lots in this area for access to lot nine in the form of a dead end private way that we built the public road standards. What we are proposing again in this plan is that rather than build a complete year round through road out to two lights, that this extension which is shown here out to two lights be a town standard road be a gated with a breakaway barrier so that we have the opportunity not to generate through traffic up and down Hunts Point Road and out through the project, but we still keep the issue of safety vehicles, of emergency access, and of security open and available to the town's forces. It would be a gate that would be controlled by public works and the police, and it's something that we discussed last time, and the comments were that it uh, was worthy of some additional review. We feel it's something that the staff needs to sit down with us and discuss all the pros and cons and then come back to the board with the staff review. I think that's something that we would coordinate through Steve and through Chief Pickering and the fire chief as well as the town engineer. Steve, yes. is that um, road crash gate uh, something that's up to town standards? We would propose that to be built to town standards and then yeah. gate with that gate. So it right. can be plowed and maintained year round. Does that mean if there if there were a problem, and I know the residents in that area, I'm, I'm one of them, are some people don't ever want another access because they they like the uh, the low crime and the inability of anyone to uh, uh, to roam around the neighborhood and get out. And there are others who would like one. Are you saying that if at some point in time um, the wrong decision were made, the ability is there to to do something? That's the intent of this proposal, that if, in reviewing it later on, if it's, it's deemed that the policy was incorrect and we do need a full-time road, that the gate could be taken down and that could become a year-round road. Yeah. The key thing that this differs from the original plans is that road has always, had always been designed as one continuous road without a stop and intersection. Under this design, you would be creating, if you will, a second intersection. The other designs that this board has seen always contemplated road geometry that kept a continuous curve and had one intersection at Hunts Point. This then becomes a two intersection road 
which makes it a little more difficult passage to the site, which, again, I think tempers that decision whether it's a full year-round road or just an emergency road. The one last point that I'd like to make on this plan before I open up to board comment is that the thing that this considers that was not previously considered is a relocation of the existing house and barn. If you recall, the primary reason that we haven't been back before the board with the issue of access into and out of the parcel and the existence of that barn and house. What this proposes is to keep that structure intact, rotate it on the site, and move it to a location where that is preserved as an amenity to the town and relocate on the site such that we get safe access into and out of the site. We realize that there are some other issues that this brings up vis-a-vis -vis the traffic, the site distance, and the issue of wetlands and wetlands impact with this that still need to be addressed. But this, an overview, is what our intent is. We would protect this lower wetland with a conservation easement. Again, that would be strictly an easement that runs to the Conservation Commission to protect that as a part of this large functioning wetland that runs down and actually finds its way into the lower portions of um, the road immediately down here. This is the former Maxwell piece. And I don't know who the current owner is that was sold. But that's that's the intent of the plan. What I'd like are some board comments and inputs on whether or not this still has some merit, whether it's worth proceeding in terms of this as a concept and going ahead and what some of those issues might be with respect to the board and directions so that Mr. Kennedy can proceed with his planning efforts. Well, thank you, Mr. Moore. Just a few things I'd like to mention. Uh, We'd like to see proof of uh, right title and interest. Um, you, sh you show a road on top of uh, a pond, again, which uh, we critiqued months ago. I, I think I critiqued it. I think Mr. Boxer, as I recall, critiqued it. But we, are, um, we have a new wetlands ordinance, and um, that will never be allowed when that ordinance passes. Um, I, I'm just opposed to putting roads on top of beautiful ponds. Um, also, I, I was under the understanding that you would be having wells. Why would you not reach water? My only concern about wells, I don't have anything against them, but um, sometimes they dry out. Um, sometimes they become contaminated. And then at a later date, whole roads have to be ripped up at taxpayers' expense to get to water. Could you address that? We are not proposing wells on site. We are proposing to extend the existing water mains. Oh, you and are. For the water district. But it states in, you know, in what you gave us, it stated something about wells. Well, I, and I, that's, I thought I wanted to ask the question. Mm -hmm. I believe in my discussions with the Portland Water District early on, Mm -hmm. that uh, we're going to be required to loop that water main through. I would think so. So what, what I was suggesting is that... But you are correct. The letter, yeah. the letter here does indicate that it's on site well. Right. If before, so you know, I, that. I, I want um, you know, the applicant to look into finding water before the next time so that uh, at a later date taxpayers would not be responsible for that. Um, yes. The answer to you was, is the letter writing what you said, right? Because you said town water, and Mary pointed out that the letter said well. He said that that's he is looking into water. To be quite frank, I'm unclear because my last conversations with the Portland Water District were that we would be extending a water main through the site and making a loop to improve the service in Broad Cove. That was my understanding. I didn't realize that uh, Mr. Camilla had committed us to on-site wells in this yeah. letter. So, you know, I mean, I have to I'm confess to being caught short by that, and I apologize for that, and we'll have that answered at the Okay. At the next meeting. Another question is sewer available. Since so many septic systems in Broad Cove failed miserably, and millions of dollars worth of sewers um, had to be um, installed there, uh, and since this seems like such a, a wet area, um, how do we know that uh, the septic systems are going to to um, not fail? 
And so is sewer available? Is this filling growth or is it not? That would be a question I would have. I don't know enough about the sewers, but it's just another question. And another question that I had was, why the mix of the public and the private roads? I've seen that before. You know, technically, people who live in Broad Cove, you know, would be uh, trespassing if they went on these private roads that you're proposing. Is there any reason why you are proposing that some of those roads be private versus roads that belong to the town of Cape Elizabeth? It's only a question I'm asking to prepare for for next time. Um, also, I would think that on that crash, crash gate situation, it would be very important um, to get the opinions of staff, people, police, fire, but also it would be very important to me to hear what the people of Broad Cove had to, to say about that. Um, I would also like to see an alternative plan. For there, might be another, there might be another way to, to be a little more creative with that, to have roads that aren't um, private, stuck in various places. There must be a, a more creative way to reconfigure that. I think there is. You have to address that. Anyone else on the planning board? The hour grows late. I think Mr. Tinsman. <laughs> Mr. Tinsman. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and that's what I'm trying to say so much, and I promise not to say enough. Um, Mr. Chairman, in, uh, a year ago we were presented with three alternative, alternate plans that uh, the planning board looked at in a mm -hmm. similar meeting, and uh, looking at the notes that uh, Land Use Consultants has, has been so uh, uh, forethinking in, in providing to us, um, we see that some of us commented on some of the alternates and I in particular commented on this alternative as being uh, one of the best of the three that were proposed at that time. And I still feel that way. I think that, uh, that for, uh, from a land use consideration that uh, these 11 lots make a lot more sense than some of the other plans that were submitted. And granted, not all alternates were uh, submitted before. Um, just a couple of, of comments as a pre-application meeting, perhaps. I think most of those who have commented from the board's perspective have mentioned the crash gate. I think that will be one of the bigger issues in the, in the review, other than the technical issues of drainage and um, all of those other things that are on our, our checklist and in the town ordinances. The crash gate is probably going to, to take the longest discussion. Uh, there's a crash gate or a gate that's shown, which is more of a residential driveway gate and, and may be difficult for our public works department to <coughs> open during a 12-inch snowstorm so that they can plow through it. Um, but the, I'm sure that that will be one of the uh, big things that will be discussed. I guess of most concern is something that you raised, Madam Chairman, about, um, about the Broad Cove neighborhood, there will be a number of agendas that will want to be pursued by differing groups in Broad Cove, I would imagine. And uh, Mr. Boxer indicated that uh, there will be some that will be in favor of uh, a through road and some that will be opposed. So we'll be dealing with different agendas. That will be a very difficult process, I would think, for the applicant to try to maintain all of those agendas. Um, and that's going to be a very difficult process for this board to sort out. And that relates principally to whether it's a through road or if it's a, uh, a closed condition uh, road. So I would expect that that will be a, a major issue. I'm really pleased that the applicant has brought in uh, something that was discussed with the applicant before about walkways and about the ability of people in Broad Cove to traverse the site to get to another important resource being Crescent Beach. And a lot of people in Broad Cove use the land now in its vacant form uh, to get to the Crescent Beach here, and I think that that's something that, uh, above all else, has to be maintained. It's a, it is a unique resource. 
I'm pleased that Mr. Kennedy has indicated a walkway through the property, um, and I think that that's something that's very uh, commendable. I do have a question about the southern conservation easement, uh, which is the site of a current road that historically was used on the property. It goes right along the edge of the, of the walkway. And whether or not in that conservation easement the applicant is proposing the ability for people in Broad Cove to traverse that conservation easement as well. Uh, and I would hope that that would be the case. Uh, so that is a question. Thank you, Mr. Jimsy. Mrs. Rand, oh, <laughs> she asked her <laughs> line. Yeah. Then you okay. may, you may go ahead. Go um, ahead, Alice. I just would uh, like to say that I was very. Uh, I think it's very commendable that you have come in with this uh, small number of lots. I also think it is uh, very pleasing to see that the uh, house, farmhouse, is being saved. Um, I would wonder about the. Um, walkway, the Catherine P. Kennedy walkway, uh, I wonder if that might not have to be a suspension bridge going all the way through there, and that we might not have to put on our hip boots. Uh, and so I would like uh, just to have a further, or perhaps a better definition of that, because we do want to be able to walk through there. And I, I understand that perhaps uh, this area is very well, and that where it may have originally have been placed might have been a little drier. So I, I'd just like a little more clarification on that. Um, our new subdivision ordinance does uh, state that we shouldn't have more than a 500-foot dead-end road, but um, we at, at any rate, we shouldn't have longer than a thousand foot uh, foot dead end roads serving more than 20 dwelling units. So I wondered, uh, what does Channel View Road serve? How many houses? I believe, again, that rather than search through the file, my memory says that it was either 13 or 17. So to err on the conservative side, I believe there are 17 existing lots on Channel View, and we're proposing to add. Two. Two more. Okay. So we'll push it to a total of 19. 19. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Mrs. Rand. Mr. Boxer. Yeah, well, this, this is your time to get reactions. And over the years, uh, having lived in Broad Cove for 20 years in several different houses, I've seen uh, it start with, uh, I think it was 200 condominium units at one time. Uh, so frankly, I, I think that Mr. Kennedy is to be commended uh, in general not to say they don't have some, some questions and concerns, but uh, having just uh, basically told somebody that uh, nine homes on 11 acres uh, was a little bit much. I don't know if you were there for that performance. Mm -hmm. um, I think if we have 11 homes on 78 acres, uh, we're getting a lot closer to the objectives of, uh, of the people of the town. And, and I think that, that really is admirable, although I suspect that uh, um, the fight for more might, uh, might, might not be worth it, but I, but I do think we need to be committed for that. Uh, um, secondly, I, I know that, uh, that there is considerable division on whether a crash road or a regular road ought to be provided. Uh, I disagree very much with uh, some of the people on the, in, on the staff of the town, uh, but if there's a way uh, of preserving what you've tried to do, which is uh, not have one long road uh, and and not really disrupt the whole neighborhood, uh, but have something where whatever the ultimate decision is, uh, it can be a crash road or a full road. That might make our job easier. If it's if it's sort of if it isn't the crash road, then it's going to be a different plan that makes our job harder. And I think I heard you say that the, that the the intent of that proposal was so that it could be either if it had to. And when the time comes, we'll all advocate our positions. Um, I picked up on, on one of the things that, uh, that Dick did, too. Uh, I think the, the lower conservation easement uh, would look very nice with the, that dirt road or a piece of it being a walkway there. And that, Alice, is usable. Uh, the, the upper one, I think Alice has a good point that, uh, that you have to find something that's usable. But I think 
the lower one in part because of the ponds and the access to them and the number of people that, that walk to Kettle Cove and Two Lights, uh, not just from Broad Cove, but I, I see Mr. Tinsman occasionally walking from wherever he lives down some of those roads. So it's a two-way street and I think they, they might want to look at uh, a strip of access along that lower easement which would allow people to get to those ponds that are used for skating by a lot of people in Cape Elizabeth, again, not just in the neighborhood. Uh, I don't know what that'll do to the parking around there. Um, another uh, uh, general concern I have about that area uh, is when you locate your test pits, if you haven't already, uh, I assume with four or five or six acre or more um, house lots that there'll be large homes in there. And I, I think it's going to be important not to uh, come back with some of these marginal test pits that uh, um, a small three-family home would be satisfactory for, uh, but to make the subsurface disposal findings realistic for the type of homes that are going to be developed, or, or at least to my mind, be facing some sort of a condition that probably uh, would, would limit the area to the uh, uh, to the homes that the test pits uh, show can be uh, uh, can be handled. Uh, so th those are my my general comments. And again, I think uh, um, the number of lots is commendable. And also another thing that uh, that I think differs makes this differ from some other plans too is that virtually none of that is going to be seen by people. I'll probably see more of it than anybody else. Correct. Uh, but again, I contrast it with the previous plan where. Uh, you're going to see nine or ten houses from a road, and, and I suspect that in that 78 acres, uh, uh, there won't be much that will be seen, and I think that's a positive aspect of the plan, too. Thank you, Mr. Boxer. Any other questions or comments? Just to address two, if I might. I think, obviously, when we drew this, if you look at the road and its adjacency to the pond, I think the board can be assured that the intent of both the developer and us is not to put a road through a pond or through a wetland. In addition to the town's regulations, there's also the new guidelines from the state with regard to Natural Resource Protection Act, right. so we will stay out of wetlands with that Good. road. And I did have the opportunity to walk the Catherine Kennedy Bird Sanctuary with the Conservation Commission last year, and I'm not sure when that was, it might have been April or May. And the walkway that's shown on there is one that was charted because we walked at the time, and I think Alice's comments are appropriate. It is a wet site. That was a location where I think my then seven-year-old son ended up into his hips in a pond, in one of those ponds in the water. Mr. Kennedy has indicated that he will be proposing to build a walkway, bridges, things of that nature. What I would offer to this board is that we will be meeting with the Conservation Commission. We will go through another site walk, and we will end up with that walkway in a location that's appropriate so it can be used and used regularly and maintained because that's the intent of the, the Greenbelt plan, that that has some longevity to it. So we will look at that location, and we'll get that in a place where conservation is satisfied and come back to this board with the endorsement. And with that, I appreciate your comments. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Mr. Tinsley, would Chairman, you have an additional statement? Not an additional. Um, I'd ask Steve to comment on the um, public access across the existing road on the Southerly Conservation Easement, if he could. Okay. <laughs> Which he nicely avoided. Can I go off record? Uh, we've discussed that at length with the developer in terms of of two issues which this board has wrestled with before. And I'm not trying to avoid the question, I'm going to come at it in a different way. There was a question raised back in late 1987 about, number one, the existence of that road and whether it stays and remains or whether it has any possibility of being vacated. And along with that, the relationship of any proposed roads and amendments off of Hunts Point and a previously recorded plat and what those amendments represent. That's a legal issue with regard to that existing right-of-way that in my discussions with the developer, if we find that we in fact can't vacate that and that will remain, that we will then open that up to public access and have an access way through there. I don't know if Mr. Kennedy is going to decide to go ahead with a 
vacating procedure, whether that's legally possible or probable. That's something that, that I don't know. But that, as far as I know, is the hinge or key factor in the discussions about public access through that. If you recall, about three generations back, we had a walkway tucked down along the southern edge. There is, it is wet, but there is a little area of highland right on a ridge right back in here. So in the event that we end up looking at the issue of that road staying or not staying, I can certainly come back if there is enough upland area there that we can avoid getting into a wetlands alteration and keep it a dry area. We can look at alternatives for access through there if that's the board's wish. We'll look at that and we'll have a definitive answer for you at the next presentation. Well, thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you for coming and I'm sure we'll see you again. So next time you'll see Mr. Fresco and Mr. Camilla, hopefully. Thanks Thank you. again. Okay, any other business to come before this board? What? Workshop. Workshops. Okay. Um, just an update on the workshops uh, to planning board members. On April 4th, that's uh, three days after the site walk on April 1st, uh, how many of you will be able, I hope all of you, to attend the, uh, the joint planning board meeting with South Portland at 7 p.m. at the town hall? Uh, you're all planning on coming. You think, Dan, that you will be here? You'll be here? Great. It's a catered event. Well, actually, yes. just serving something real good, I'll be sure to be here. We'll be sure to do that. Actually, what I think we talked about more recently after the last meeting was to look at actually switching it from here in town hall where it would have to be catered and everything else to mm -hmm. having it at a restaurant oh. and given the fact that there's a scarcity of them in Cape Elizabeth it seemed like we we're going back to South Portland oh, that that can so be changed but I think that's oh well that's, I about. think it's a fine idea to go to a restaurant and uh, you know whatever <laughs> happens you know we but we will be there if it's at a restaurant or if it is at the town hall. And it looks like it's going to be, unless people have strong objections or preferences, it looks like it's going to be a channel cross. Madam Chairman, I, I suggested that the last meeting that we have in South Portland at a restaurant, and then somebody who watched this program uh, uh, suggested that that may have been inappropriate, and I think I agreed with them after, after the uh, meeting. And basically, and, and it goes along with something Dan has said earlier tonight, that we like to think of ourselves as a rural community and we're really half mm -hmm. in one one foot half in rural and one foot in urban and right. i suppose that's suburban in between but i think it might be nice to invite our brethren to the town office and have a catered event uh, in a rural style uh, I agree. And not necessarily in a restaurant so let's have it catered in here yeah i think right. it'd be good I, I think we should stick with that i agree as long as we can all attend, because I feel this is a very important meeting, and I think, Dick, that you had um, suggested that we have an agenda yes. made up and circulated before. So, do you and think, I think that we, we can even suggested that? items to be on that agenda, which I hope we haven't lost. No, no it's haven't in, lost. They're, they're in the minutes, aren't they? They're in the minutes, and also there we. South Portland Pine Director and I have talked about them. We'll be sending out an attentive uh, list. Great. One thing I want to do now while we maybe talk about another workshop is just check the availability of downstairs. Uh, okay. I'll do that right now. On Super. That well, while, while um, he is doing that, uh, do you folks remember we got, a, it's kind of a thick blue report months ago from the Harbor Commission and there was a letter from the, um, the town manager stating that the town council would like us to report on that by May 3rd. So what I have to ask you is how do we make it? We have um, the April 4th is the uh, planning board uh, meeting with South Portland. April 18th is the regular meeting of the planning board. Now, I have here Tuesday, May 2nd, planning board workshop. Do you think that we could, at that workshop, discuss the, the Harbor Commission report and um, 
send it directly to the town council the next day? Would that be possible? I think it would be possible if we all did our homework and read the report and made comments and came to the workshop with those comments. Would that be all right if we have some homework? Mm -hmm. If you cannot attend that workshop because you're engaged elsewhere, then would it be asking too much to have to just send your comments to either Steve Butler, Jerry Dago, or myself, and we will incorporate them into our report to the town council, okay? But I don't want us to be late. I will ask Mike McGovern if, you know, we could have a few days beyond that, but the letter states specifically May 3rd, and we've been so busy. What about, uh, can we get this? Uh, I think Jerry's going to have to use his master key. Well, I think we could find out about that later. Do I hear a uh, motion to adjourn? So moved. Okay, so seconded. We are adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>